second half, I've got the pleasure of introducing you to um, two of our valued customers. When I was rehearsing, I said I wasn't going to say valued customers. All my customers are valued. Um, but I want to introduce you to, uh, firstly, um, Sean and AI Sentia, who are revolutionizing the world of CT scans. So over to you, Sean. Thank you. Okay, it's done. Sure. So thank you very much, Tim, for the kind introduction. And my thanks to everyone here in the audience for your attention and energy as we go through the talk today. Um, while we're getting the technical setup done, I'll get my intro out of the way. So good afternoon, Sean Walsh, uh, CEO of AI Sentia. And I'm delighted to be here with the co-founder of AI Sentia, Professor Regent Lee from the Nuffield Hospital. Um, let me set the scene for you. So this talk, the purpose of it, it can be considered a success if there are questions triggered in your mind. So if you in the audience listen to me speak for some time and it triggers something in you that you want to know more, and I hopefully engage in a constructive conversation with you afterwards, that's the point of this. It's not for me to sit up here and, and talk about all the things I'm doing in my daily life uh, to use up your time. So without further ado, we'll get going. Tim pointed out that we're revolutionizing CT scanning with AI. And I would justify we are doing that. And today, hopefully, I will convince you of it. But please challenge and push back if you think you're not convinced by the end of it. Let's see how we go. So I'm speaking as a scientist. My background is science. I studied physics for best part of a decade, degree, master's, PhD, and then transitioned into the world of a researcher. So working in Oxford, working in Sydney, working on the continent in Maastricht, and then became an entrepreneur. I'm delighted to be in Oxford now working in entrepreneurship and working with our partners OCC to actually bring this innovation from idea and commercial pitch into the clinic. So we're going to talk more about that today. I think everyone looking up at that screen recognizes a CT scan. Uh, it's a 3D image of the body. When we get them, we know there's something very serious going on in our lives. And it's something which we need to take serious attention to. Um, and to help humans, because humans are not perfect, to Kaz's point earlier, we need some support. Um, when this procedure was invented, it was by Godfrey Hounsfield, and he came up with a grayscale value scale to make sense of all this. Humans are built on biology and we have eyes. I don't know if your eyes are perfect or if they're subjective, because they all are in this room, but they don't see grayscale very well. We see in color, but that image is grayscale. And to make sense of it, it's quite difficult you know, there's a lot of shades of gray in there, literally, and to go with the metaphor. So it's confusing. To fix it, as a physicist, a physicist came up with a great idea and said, you know what, we can get rid of those shades of gray if we stick in a contrast imaging agent. This is going to have a K-edge shell. It's going to make a huge peak in the detector, and we're going to see white instead of gray. It's going to be really obvious what's wrong with the patient. So this is actually how this problem was solved. If you want to know what's going on inside the patient, physically inject them, put material in their body, that will show up, that will create a Christmas tree light effect, and we're gonna know what's going on. And it makes perfect sense, and it served us really, really well. Um, but if you fast forward to today, a machine is not like a human. So a shade of gray to a machine is one versus two. It's not subjective, it's not ambiguous, it is crystal clear, it is black and white. So a machine can see every single one of those pixels or voxels in perfect clarity. And that's what AI Sentia's value proposition is. The majority of CT scans in the world require this process. And if you look at these images, left, middle, and right, and you follow, hopefully you should see a big difference. You see the shades of gray turning to bright white? That's the value we're talking about. Now, that is achieved via a physical process. We take two CT scans, we inject a material in between, and quite honestly, we put a patient at risk because this doesn't come without any cost. There's no such thing as a free lunch. This has achieved the clinical need. We now can visualize, we can diagnose, and we can do things better. It's perfectly justified, and we should be doing it, but it can be better. As you can see now, there's a lot more information. What's our value proposition? We're claiming that this conventional workflow is outdated and outmoded and no longer required. So if I go into the clinic now and touch wood, there's something very, very wrong with me, uh, the radiologist will say, well, let's give you a contrast scan to figure out exactly what's going on. They'll bring me in, they'll put the IV line, you know, after a bit of time, 
they'll work up, they'll find a vein if they're lucky, um, and it won't hurt too much. They'll get it in, they'll put me on the table. They'll take a scouting scan to get me all set up and calibrated to make sure they make sense of it. Then they'll take the actual scan to capture the vital information and get out the actual information, which is going to you know, make me better, allow treatment to be effective and get me going. That's what we do today. That's what millions, if not hundreds of millions of people around the world are actually undergoing. That's the process. What AI Sentia is saying we can do is the information's already there. It's just not being processed correctly. It's as simple as that. The information is in the scan, and it's not being analyzed in the correct way. So through the power of AI and sophisticated image analysis, we can remove the physical material. There's no need for an IV line. There's no need for contrast imaging agent. There's no need for two scans. You just process it correctly, and you get the information out and visualize it in a way that can be actionable. So we get from A to Z just as we wanted, but we use a completely different process to do it, and that's the power of AI. And Seeing is believing. So if you look at this image, on the left is what the input is in both cases. In the middle is what AI can achieve. And on the right is what's physically produced. I don't know if there's too many radiologists in the room, but that's very, very, very close to being exactly the same. So with that demo, I hope I've convinced you that actually with the same input, you can get out what you need. Now, why does that matter, though? So I've, I've kind of gone on a bit of a ramble there and said, this is a good thing. We're going we're gonna to do something important. Well, what does it actually you know, add up to in the end? Well, it's safer. And we all know that safety is paramount, but let, let's put that into risk. If I ask everyone in this room to come with me outside, jump in a plane, and we're all going to jump out of it and have a great time, we're going to use our parachutes. Many of you would immediately wonder, well, should I be doing that? I'm not sure if I love parachutes, or I'm not sure if I want to get out of a plane. Because each of you knows at the back of your mind, there's like a one in X chance something goes wrong. You know, that's a risk I'm not thrilled about. I mean, I know it's highly unlikely, but there's a very, very small chance that something's going to go catastrophically wrong with my parachute, and I'm not going to have a great day. You know, my life's going to be in a serious, serious place. Well, let's flip it. It's the same with contrast for very, very good reasons. We give people contrast imaging agent, and there is a tiny, minute chance, like being struck by lightning, that things will go wrong. But it's there. So a very small amount of patients have severe complications with this procedure, and a very, 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 very small amount actually suffer horrific complications because of this. If you can eliminate that and take it away, it's better. And that's what we do. That risk is now completely eliminated. It is safe for healthcare. So it removes for people the discomfort, which is great for the majority. But for the very, 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 very unfortunate tiny minority, it actually saves their life. So that's something to keep in mind. It is safer healthcare. Faster healthcare. We all want to be more productive. If you just look at the logistics of this process, we're going from taking a complex procedure where you have to get an ID line in, you have to do a scouting scan, you have to calibrate the machine, you have to do the secondary scan, and then you have to get it out. That's all reduced by a factor of two. The longer you're doing the IV line, you're not doing two scans. You're not bringing in the material from around the world. So it's much faster. Radiology departments can now be effectively 100% more productive. That's not a bad win for an under-stressed and pressured health service. It does create a problem, because if you can scan more patients, you've got to interpret more data. So that's a secondary. You know, It's like whack-a-mole. You solve one problem, you create another one. But AI can help with that too, but that's not the point here. The point is we can get better productivity out of our departments. Equitable healthcare. So we all believe in fairness uh, and you know, doing the right thing. That's what equitable healthcare is. If you happen to be elderly and you're sick, you could be at increased risk for this. And you know, your doctor, for very good clinical reasons, might say, you know what, I'm not sure if you can actually withstand contrast imaging agents, so I'm not going to do it. But now I have a bit of a problem because I'm not exactly sure what's going on with you. So that's just something which is due to your age. You can also be unfortunate enough to have you know, damage to your kidneys from pre-existing comorbidity. Doctor can conclude the same. I'm not going to put you through the stress of giving you this contrast imaging agent because it may complicate your situation and your health further. That's not fair. In this scenario, you can have the procedure. So those people who are at risk are in a minority, and they are the minority, but they still deserve the best health care that we can provide. These patients can get this service now and can actually have the outcomes which they deserve. And finable, finally, sorry, it's sustainable. So if you consider the elimination of something, um, when you eliminate things, you just basically remove waste. If you think that there's millions of scans going on around the world, 
Each one of those scans requires contrast imaging agent. Each one of those contrast imaging agents requires a surgical IV line, surgical steel, single-use plastic, transport, delivery, and shipping. It starts to add up to be something which is not at all trivial. It's a, it's a massive, massive impact on the world. So if you can eliminate that kind of waste, improve productivity, make sure the people who need the care are getting it, and you can do it safer than what's currently there, that's the value which AI is doing uh, in our algorithm, and that's the value we're bringing to the health service and to society. So with that, it's a whirlwind tour of what AI Sentia is and what we bring to the table. And now I would deeply appreciate questions about any part of that story which didn't add up. Any part of that story you think is incomplete or overly simplified, because the point of this session is to actually engage, network, and bring value to each other. And I'd be delighted to have a conversation now with our partners at OCC and at the University of Oxford in the Nuffield to talk about how AI is revolutionizing medical imaging. Thank you for your time and attention. Please. Um, that's yeah, very interesting thought. So what are the main barriers to it being uh, present now, like in the field of imaging contrast? Okay. Yeah, so th there's many barriers. You're absolutely right. Th there's a ton. And we are tackling them. So the first is the barriers to adoption in terms of the workflow of the hospital. You cannot make things more complex for either the patient or the staff. So we're working with the trusts in Oxford to actually demonstrate this, that their workflow will be improved and it's not just a, a slideshow. So there's one thing, you've got to prove, not just in a forecast, but actually in tests and pilots, that if you introduce this technology into the workflow, it will fit in and it won't create unknown complications and confusion and people will just work around it, right? So one is actually the user experience around, is this making things better? That's one aspect. Another aspect, of course, is the clinical evidence. So you've got to demonstrate that the regulatory authorities allow you access to go to the trust and put this thing in the clinic to begin with. So the FDA, UKCA, CE marking, that can be done. So David gave a talk earlier. There are plenty of well-structured uh, processes you need to follow to show the level of evidence. And we're well on track to do that. That leads me into the next question around commercial application, because once you have something which the regulatory authorities have cleared the users on the ground and the, pa the patients want, so they're happy to use it, it better be commercially viable, otherwise you're not gonna have enough actual power behind the company to sustain and deliver that value. So you've gotta actually make sure your, econom your unit economics, your cost benefit analysis to the NHS add up, because there's a hundred other innovations competing for those resources, and if that's better money spent, pounds put to better use, you're not gonna get into the clinic. So those are the three aspects we're taking care of. We are working with independent health economists to show that, that the cost savings are there, that the qualities are there. We're working with doctors, nurses, and patients to demonstrate through our PPIE that this is really gonna help the patient experience, really help the work experience of the staff on the ground. And also, of course, we're engaged with the FDA and the regulatory authorities. So those are the three major barriers to any innovation. I mean, we, like any medical science company, have to come and here's that. So I hope did that yeah, yeah. give you a good okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, sorry, who's <laughs> who's moderating? <laughs> yeah. So thank you for the introduction. Can I ask you to join the dots in terms of put some pictures of um, risks and reagents in the patient okay. and the family? What are you actually doing with the AI? Are you okay. detecting the shape of the organism? Um, you know, without getting away sure. from yeah, yeah, yeah. your IP. Yeah, 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 you're right, because it is IP, but jo joining the dots. So what does AI do? And it is generative AI. So the first thing you need to do with um, generative AI, and, I, and if David's here, please jump in and <laughs> correct or challenge anything I, I'm speaking about. You have a student. So one thing we do is we segment first. So we have, it's a distribution of systems. The AI says, what am I interested in? In this case, we're talking about abdominal aortic aneurysms. So it says, okay, here is the aorta in the body focus your attention here. So it actually identifies, just like a student should be, focus here. This is what, don't be concerned, answer the question you're asked. <laughs> so the AI immediately focuses on that anatomical region. The next thing we do is, and that's done with a UNET, if people are considering, so, and this is well documented in literature. 
The next thing you do is you go with the generative model and you say, look, this is what non-contrast looks like. This is what contrast looks like. You need to learn this representation. And there's many, many paired matchings for you to learn. And after a while, the student, after being directed to pay attention here, and then learn what a non-contrast <coughs> voxel looks like. So those shades of gray in the first scan, which we were talking about, and then you show it the ground truth on the right-hand side. It very quickly, as a machine can do, because to a human, it's quite a subjective task. Machine, it's really straightforward. It is a matrix of numbers. That DICOM is just a 3D cube of numbers. And to a machine, it becomes very straightforward. It was a bit surprising to me, but as a physicist, when I stepped back and said, logically, what's happening? It's a straightforward polynomial function between input, output, and it does a remarkable job. When you focus it to say, these numbers, don't try and solve everything, you know, don't boil the ocean, do this. And that's, that's what the IP is basically based on. Thanks, Marian. I hope that was helpful. Please, I saw more questions. Yeah. Is it a local solution? Like, is it localized to that? particular machine, or is it some sort of a SaaS solution where you actually uh, ah, okay. using your tool in the cloud somewhere? Ah, Tim, it's a great question. So uh, this is this is an engineering. So you can you can um, butter the toast any way you want. So the AI itself can be deployed locally or in the cloud. For commercial reasons, of course, you want to go in the cloud because far better unit economics and the fact that you have a centralized system which is easy to maintain and you can just distribute to the world. For many, many good reasons, lots of people say, no, I'm not happy shifting to the cloud. So you're going to have to give me my on-site premises. And Germany is a perfect market of that, where they say, according to our laws, that SaaS model, because David pointed it, does the data move or does the model move? You've got to look at it both ways. In some jurisdictions, like the US, they're very happy to push that data in. You say it's HIPAA compliant, put it in the cloud, no problem. And you do have to be compliant. In Germany, they would say, absolutely not. The model comes out of the cloud into the server, and it runs locally, and it's logged. So I can prove and verify and audit that and then go back. So, so that really becomes a commercial and engineering challenge about what markets you're operating in and what people are comfortable with because it's the work culture then. You know, in some places, they'll have a heart attack if, you, if they have the idea that data is moving and in others, it's, they don't even blink an eye. So we do that all the time. So I hope that gives you, we do both. It's just driven by the market. What is your um, acceptable and norm of working? Yeah. I, there was someone very patiently waiting for it. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, so let's clap. Thank you very much for the question. And I want to clarify the red herring aspect of it. Is it on the commercial side? So is, it, is the red herring from your position the actual re the real impact, as in the sustainability in the world, or is it about the actual reimbursement of that sustainability? Okay. Okay, gotcha. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you very much for clarifying. So, uh, like, from, from the business perspective, we can say, okay, where's the value created? So, on the value created side, it is definitely real. You can go out there and get an environmental impact analysis, and they'll say, you're definitely more sustainable. So, you're creating value in the sense of there's a lot less waste. So that's good. The capture bit comes to your point about will NICE pay for it? Because you can create value, and if no one's paying for it, then you've created something, but no one's actually monetized it or claimed that value. NICE won't recommend or reimburse it. That's absolutely right. However, it's unavoidable that this is going to come, let's say, indirectly, because what happens is the NHS has a net zero target by law. And what's going to happen is even though NICE aren't pushing for these things, saying that's a sustainable solution, therefore it's recommended, you're just going to have trust saying, I need to hit a target. There's a lot of other pressure coming legally and politically on me to find a way to make this number go down in my trust. Therefore, the value is going to come that way. That's, that's the unique NHS position. There are other jurisdictions, and this is something in flux and dynamic, but there are other jurisdictions in the world which are starting to try and put um, a euro value or a dollar value or a pound, yen, pick your currency value on that environmental element. Just like we do with a life, we have qualies. And in the Netherlands, off the, because that was the last market I was working in, 80,000 euro for one year of life. That's what the Dutch government and the health service in the Netherlands said, is if you can prove that you extend life by one year beyond a certain threshold, we'll allow you to charge 80,000 euro for that. If you can't, that's the threshold. So they were trying to prove it. And that's, that's a 
a value equivalent. So it will be subjective across all these different regimes. Um, and that's how the, the economics is going to sort of shake out. But that, that'll go up and down depending on the price of oil, right? You know, if we're consuming lots of oil and our carbon footprint's going up, the sustainability argument becomes more important. Um, you know, if we all of a sudden, <coughs> the Americans crack coal fusion and share it with the world, I don't know about that, but you know, then um, we're going to be in a good place because energy will be abundant. So it's, there's, there's a lot of things over the next 20 years, we'll see how it develops. Thank you, though. These are really, thank you for the whole three questions. They're really helpful. Someone else get triggered? Some, some other aspect of it? AI side, data side, engineering side? Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, because it is important about, so we're an SME, they're all about speed. Everything in our DNA is pushing us to deliver. So our investors do that along with our founders because we're passionate about making things happen. So that first solution, which was demoed there, we expect that to be on the market in the US in 2023, right? So just before the end of the year, because the evidence is already there for it. And there are already predicate devices people spoke about saying, you know, we didn't have to break the door down. Someone else has opened the door for us. AI is in the clinic in the US. Once you show the value is there and the evidence is there, you, you're free to walk through it if you get your paperwork together. So that's what we'll do. Europe, unfortunately, is a very different question because there are not enough notified bodies in the UK and Europe to go around. So there is a known backlog. So the sad truth of it is in Europe, if, if we present the same file to the FDA, we can go to them and say, this is really urgent, we'd like to pay you because we care, and they'll fast track it. And they guarantee that it will get seen in a certain amount of time, and they'll give a decision, yes, no, you're cleared for use. In Europe, you cannot do that, and it's understaffed. The FDA is extremely well resourced. So if, when we submit the file in the US and we submit it in the UK and Europe, there will be a delay of at least nine months, relatively speaking. And that's something totally outside of our track. We cannot do anything about it. That's a European problem. And Brexit made it worse for everyone because the notified bodies used to share the work around and now they can't actually. And the UK was one of the leading bodies in this. So it's, it's a problem for everyone. There is a shortfall there. There's just not enough people to review the actual regulatory files. So that's a, that's a problem. We'll respond to it. I'm sure there's a big drive. But So US this year, early 2024, UK and Europe, it's going to be at least nine to 12 months later, depending on their factors. Please. How would you get to use that as speed model if you actually store for the purposes of medical use cases? Um, uh, uh, quick answer is how long is it? Oh. Yes, it, it is easy, depending on your skill set, right? So these AI models are foundational. And then what you do is you focus them. So remember I made the analogy about point the student here, give it the right appropriate data, and then ask it to learn. That you can do. Now, it'll be unique to the type of data. So that's CT data. And it's a, morphologically, it's quite clear. A good rule of thumb is if a human can see it inside a second, once their attention is there, these AI will get it very quickly too. If it takes a human expert you know, a bit of time to decide, that's a really tricky problem whatever imaging modality you're talking about, CT, MRI, or ultrasound. So they can be repurposed with, with hundreds. You don't need millions of patients for these things, especially in imaging tasks. The questions become when it's subtle. So if you require three humans, you know, one radiologist, second radiologist, they degree, and a third radiologist to come in and adjudicate, that is something where you're going to need thousands and thousands of um, scans for an AI to pick it up, because a human is already struggling. And once a human's struggling, there's nothing magical about the perception of AI to see. Um, it will struggle with that too. The, the, the real interesting thing is here is that humans do not like slightly different shades of gray, but to a machine that is really not a problem. It could not be more crystal clear to different shades of gray, which is why it can do it and we biologically are just encumbered. Thank you. Oh, last, or I can get, oh, shit. <laughs> Okay, yeah, this is a great question. So your, your value, your AI is only as good as your data and your annotation. Because if you have wonderful data, but you've terrible people marking it up, it's not going anywhere. This, we are an SME, so we are not Google. Um, we were working with the University of Oxford. So that is something which is well resourced. You brilliant minds at Oxford collecting this data in the hospital, in the trust, curating it, 
making it available, marking it up correctly. So this on an academic level is world, world class, right? But it wasn't thousands and thousands and thousands. We're talking about hundreds. And when you do the, the augmentation um, techniques and things to really squeeze the lemon, the juice out of the lemon, there's a lot you can do with visual uh, image analysis to descend things, crop them, auto, auto rotate. <laughs> I'm definitely going to come to you after, but I think we'll have to do it online. So hundreds of patients, very good doctors, at least three doctors to curate and annotate, and then good engineering because the architecture, this thing is moving at lightning pace. So a couple of years ago, it was absolutely world class, leading in the field. It needs to be refreshed just like everything else because you know this thing moves at rock, rocket speed. So we have to update it. But I hope that gives you a sense of where we were. And I'll come to you absolutely in a moment so we can, because I think Tim is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that. So um, thank you all very much for engagement, and I look forward to speaking with you all today. Thank you. Thank you.